Now, it's my pleasure to welcome to the virtual stage, Eric Brewer, the area tech lead over Istio, Spanner, and other teams at Google. Eric's resume is longer than my arm, which means he needs no introduction, but I was amazed to learn that he is the inventor of the CAP theorem. As a matter of fact, it's also known as Brewer's theorem. This means if it weren't for Eric, we would be able to have doc uh, distributed data stores which are consistent, available, and partition tolerant. That's right, everyone. It's all his fault. Welcome to IstioCon, Eric. Hi, I'm Eric Brewer from Google. I'm here to talk about Zero Trust and Istio today. Now, I was involved in Istio from the beginning, and it was actually quite a bit of fun, and it's been quite a journey. I just want to point out that Istio started actually with many ideas of Zero Trust uh, built in, and we'll see why that is in, later in the talk. But the strategy that matters here is a few things. It's first that at the core, Istio is about kind of decoupling policies from your actual source code and applications. Historically, if you have an application with the source code containing the policy, then it's hard to change the policy, right? You have to redeploy the application. But kind of worse than that, it's actually hard to be consistent across all your applications, or in this case, all your microservices, and make sure they all have the same policies, and that when someone does a launch, that the new thing also has the same policies. And so when I say decouple, what I mean is that the platform team can set the policies and update them as they like, and application developers can build services and applications without breaking the policies and really, without really even worrying about how do you get the policies right uh, given the changing nature of these things. Zero trust is one particular kind of policy decoupling, meaning how do we get a zero trust architecture, which I'll define in the rest of this talk, that's an important policy that we get out of having this decoupling. And then kind of the third part of the strategy is, well, once you have a, a proxy implementing policies, it turns out it's useful for a bunch of other things like traffic management and telemetry. And so you use it as a framework in general for adding value to microservices. So what is zero trust and how did we get here? And it comes back to classic firewalls, what we call the castle approach. So in the castle approach, you have a firewall around what you value and you believe incorrectly that that firewall will protect you from all of the bad things. And in fact, it doesn't. And for example, you now have mobile workers, people working from home. They're actually outside your physical firewall, but inside your network, right? They must be to get their work done. You of course have insider threats. You have vendors and extra groups that work with you that you may not trust as much as some other groups that you work with. Uh, and you have, of course, tons of different devices, some of which you know, expect to have internet access. So in general, all these things kind of, once you're inside the castle, there's no protection. So when we talk about zero trust, what we really mean is uh, even inside the castle, we're not actually trusting that everything is working perfectly, right? So we're not depending just on the walls of the castle. And this was brought home to Google in 2009 an attack called Aurora, in which many companies were, were attacked. Google was one of them, and the attacker, which was a state, a nation state, was able to kind of get inside the castle and wreak great havoc. Because again, the model is, we'll keep you out of the castle, but if that fails, then everything is exposed, right? And that's really what we're trying to get away from. So to get beyond firewalls, there's a few things we have to do. The first thing is what we call Beyond Corp, and this is written about you know, about 10 years ago initially, which is when we give you access to something, it's not just because you're in the network, it's because we understand who you are and what your device you're using. So things like two-factor authentications are part of that more fine-grained authentication. And in particular, when you're inside the network or connecting from a particular network, that doesn't mean per se that you have any access rights because right, we don't trust the network. We're having zero trust in the network itself as being a meaningful security barrier. And finally, that all of your access is authenticated. We know who you are, it's authorized. You have the right to do what you're trying to do. And of course it's encrypted in case someone is spying on the traffic. Even on the inside of the network, we generally want to keep things encrypted. Another kind of uh, zero trust that's less talked about, but actually more important and more relevant to Istio, it's called Beyond Prod. This is a second paper produced by Google uh, less than 10 years ago, newer paper. And it basically talks about not so much end users to your network, but actually the services themselves. And when you get to 
lots and lots of services. At the time this work was done, Google had ordered 100,000 microservices, which is, sounds like a crazy number, but it, it grows every year and it's much higher than that now. So there's no inherent mutual trust among these services. And when I say that, things like service A calling service B, well, how does service B really know it's the real service A, right? If you're trusting the network, then you say, oh, the packets came in from my network, they must therefore be trustworthy. In zero trust, we're not making that assumption. We really wanna prove that the service that's calling me is really who it says it is, right? Not only that, that it's actually running approved binaries that were built the right way, so that those weren't tampered with, and that's running on an approved machine that we can trust the machine and the OS, right? And that finally we have automated ways to do updates to software because if you can't do security updates quickly, none of the rest of the stuff is gonna work. So those are kind of the two vehicles of zero trust, these kind of end user focus for beyond corp and kind of service and infrastructure focus for beyond prod. Now, to do beyond prod, you have to actually think about it in kind of two pieces, one of which is related to Istio and one of which is not. The first part is how do I build and deploy my microservices such that I'm actually able to enforce that it's a trustworthy service running on a trustworthy machine, right? How is it built? This directly relates to a lot of other work I've been doing around supply chain security, things like log4j, is the right version of log4j in your image and do you trust that image? And if it's not, how do you get it rebuilt and redeployed? That's the kind of build and deploy side. The other side is the runtime side. I have, this is where Istio comes in. I have workloads running and now I know that service A or workload one is actually, workload one has the right binary image. It has the right credentials and we know it's running on a trustworthy machine, but it still has to prove itself to other services like workload two. And that is how, where we use the Istio service mesh to do the mutual TLS authentication among those services using the right credentials. So in this model, I have my two workloads, one of them is a client of the other, how do I trust my production client? And the way to think about this is what are the risks and, and what are the controls we put in for those risks? And in general, the, the part on the right summarizes that quite well. We're trying to get the right peer, right service you're talking to with the right credentials on behalf of the right user, particularly for end users being represented by actions. And so when you look at the list of risks, it's all kinds of things. But for example, we wanna make sure that you can't listen in on the payload. So if a, we are assuming that network is not necessarily safe, that's what zero trust means. So there may be lurkers in the network spying on the traffic, even though it's inside our quote unquote firewall, we still want the, want the traffic encrypted. So the MTLS and Istio takes care of that. And in general, that en encryption is the right approach for that risk. I'd like to make sure that clients can't pretend to be other clients. Right? Just because you have a job running on a machine, it doesn't mean that job should be able to act as other entities and use their credentials. So we really need to prove what entity is this service supposed to be and what credentials does it have. And so all clients, in this case, these are client services are explicitly authorized and have an explicit ID. We'd like to avoid replay attacks. That means basically if I send you a token, I should have to send you a different token for the next time I use an action so that I can't just use, steal a token and then, then re replay that action. I wanna make sure that if I have a client, it can't actually access all the data in our systems, just the data it was narrowly granted. So that means you have to have some way to say, this client is entitled to just this small part of the data and how to narrow the scope. And we'll give an example of that coming up. And finally, the hardest case of all, what about insider risk? So insider has access to the network, they're running jobs inside our castle, so to speak, and what can their job do and how do we limit them? Even though in general, we view them as a trusted user, we'd still like to limit what they can do. And by the way, also, which we don't talk about today, but equally important, audit what they do. A lot of times you can't catch the insider uh, and prevent their access, but you can audit it and that is enough of a deterrent because it really helps you catch them. And also if you have good audit logs, if you find an insider attack, you can then figure out all the other things they might've touched, right? So that's very important kind of control. Using Istio to do this, there's a few different aspects to how this works. First, there's how do we actually secure the workload itself? So in this case, I have a front end service and a back end service, and we're doing really the simple case of we're just trying to say, is caller A caller calling caller B, and is it really the right front end calling the right back end? And so each of these services has an identity, which you can think of as a, as a signed certificate. These are automatically managed. 
uh, and then we use those certificates to do the MTLS connection to get the traffic automatically encrypted. Right, so what's nice about this is when you write a service or an application, you don't worry about any of this. That's really the beauty of the decoupling of Istio is it's in the framework that we're doing the automatic certificate generation and key management for all the services at the same time. Uh, we have a policy that says what should be encrypted and then we can encrypt it. And you get a bunch of these other things, risk mitigations built into the system directly. All right, and that's really what you want. You really want, uh, Encryption built in, identity built in, authenticity checks built in, and then what you're left with is application developers can work on what's the application supposed to do. And they, in fact, can't get these things wrong because they're, again, not in the source code, it's in the infrastructure. So that's the easiest example. A harder example is now we want to have a front end, back end, but we would like to do it on behalf of an end user. And so the goal here is get the right peer with the right credential on behalf of the right user. Right. In particular, I don't want a client to be able to emulate all possible users because then they could exfiltrate all of our user data. Right. So in theory, they're doing a task on behalf of one uh, customer for a credit card transaction. In this case, how do we make sure that they can only access that customer's data and no other? And the way this works, again, because we wanted to narrow the tr trust as much as possible, is using a Java web token or a JOT. That's a token. That means it's a cryptographically signed thing that says this is this user's token for accessing their records, that's actually passed in from the browser. So we get the token from the end user, right? That's passed into the service. And then when the service does the access, it says, oh, I'm accessing the back end on behalf of this user. And I can prove it because I have the user's token, which is by the way, is temporary. So it doesn't last forever. Uh, and then I could have policies that say, yes, the, you can deliver this data, as long as it's from the right authenticated service with a properly provisioned uh, Java web token that says this end user authorized this transaction. And then you, by the way, you put that in the audit log so that we know that's actually what happened. Well, that's quite a bit more complicated case, but again, this is how all the Google services work. They don't all use Istio, but the way they work in general is this kind of thing where we have tokens that represent users and we check both the accessing peer client, but also the JOT or the token that's coming with it to make sure that it really is for the end user that, that they say. And in fact, unless you present a token for user's data, you can't get to user data. So really it's a very strong kind of guard that narrows access quite a bit. We go to the next case, which is even harder, where now we're worried about an insider and what they can do. And like I said, this is the hardest kind of prevent, but we have some mitigations already enabled by Istio. And again, combined with audit logging goes a long way. So here we have, we want to make sure we have the right front end talking to the right back end, but also that uh, the access is made on behalf of a strongly intended insider, meaning that we know it's really uh, someone who's supposed to have this kind of access. You can think of it as someone like is doing customer support and they need access to uh, private data for their job as customer support. And so they have some legitimate need to do the action they're trying to do. And so the way this works, and this is showed with the uh, identity where proxy, but you can do this with an OAuth2 proxy as well. You have the insider authenticate to the external proxy. That actually says, yes, this is really the insider that we believe it is. And we can prove that against where you would use something like two-factor authentication. That enables the uh, credit card front end to say, oh yes, this user using the case tool, for example, can actually access the backend data because they're doing customer support case. But the same user running their personal script represented on the bottom right actually cannot get access to the data because the access is tied both to their uh, identity but also to the tool they're using, right? And so the path they come in on matters and we can enforce path-based access using Istio and the policies we have. So basically, if you go on the right path, it's through the approved tool, you can access the data. If you go through your own, say, bash script running still inside the network, it's in the castle, uh, but it's not the approved tool, it will not have access. So you can't just write a script to get data, even though you temporarily have access to that data in your proper job role. That's the kind of, again, narrowing of, of scope that we're trying to get for the maximum security. So this is a harder case, and frankly, not as many groups do this, but the point is, this is possible with Istio, and it really is a very effective long-term thing to bet on. 
So what's next for Istio? And that's uh, super exciting. And I want to kind of go back to the history a little bit and talk about the next step. So Istio came out, uh, it was it started as a joint project with Google and IBM and Lyft. We all had somewhat similar visions of, of parts of the things we wanted to do. And that, uh, that was in 2017, you know, having already done Kubernetes in 2014, that was kind of a follow on. One way to think about this is you don't need Istio, frankly, unless you have a lot of microservices. The Kubernetes made it easy to have a lot of microservices. That's kind of the purpose of Kubernetes and even the things like Borg internally at Google that predated it. I said we had 100,000 microservices back then and it's larger now. When you have lots of microservices, that's when you really need some framework support for things like automatic encryption, automatic authentication, key rotation, those kinds of things. So ISTE was released to bring that capability to the cloud native approach. And finally, 1.0 came out in 2018 with early users like eBay and Weather Channel. And although Google has been the largest contributor on Istio, it's absolutely been a community driven effort and many players making great contributions for quite a long time. What I want to talk about today though, is our announcement that we are uh, intending to donate Istio to the CNCF. Uh, Istio has been an open source project for a long time, but with this change, it will be part of CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and it will have a, a, a good long-term home there. And that'll include actually the Istio trademark being transferred from uh, its current place under relative control of Google to the CNCF where it'll be managed like the Kubernetes trademark is managed, it allows a, a, a less risk for the broad community and a, a more truly open ecosystem. And this is the right time in some sense because there's been a, a lot of changes in Istio over the last several years. Version 1.5, for example, made some tremendous changes in, in re-architecture and it feels like it's in a great spot and, and works well with Kubernetes and we are happy to make this donation to the CNCF. CNCF has to formally accept it, uh, which we hope they will do. And then it will be part of the kind of uh, collection of things that make this more complete Kubernetes stack. The Kubernetes and its container stack, which has been in CNCF since day one and started it. Uh, the service mesh, which will hopefully join as a formally graduated project in the future, it enters in, in incubation mode. And then Knative, which is the serverless platform that was uh, previously donated to CNCF. And with that, I'll close and thank you for your time. And I'm grateful for the ETO community for all the great work we've done. And I look forward to another decade of cloud native coming forward. Thank you, Eric. Great speech as always. Let's give Eric a virtual round of applause. I am so excited about what Eric just announced. Istio is going to CNCF. This is a great step to make service mesh industry boring and really help our users. Imagine no need to shop around for different service mesh projects. It's You just pick what's most stable, most deployed in production environment, which also have a great home at CNCF. Now, I want you to uh, turn your attention to these folks. If we can bring up the slides. Yes, in case you are wondering who are these folks, right? These are the active maintainers of the Istio projects who keep the lights on for the project. Please give them a huge shout out in the chat um, how much you appreciate them to make Istio available for you. On behalf of all the active maintainers, we thank you for your interest in the Istio project. And uh, we look forward to interact and learning from each of you at the conference. Enjoy IstioCon, and we hope to see you in person soon. Thanks, everybody. See you in the Slack. <laughs>